Hi everyone, good morning. It looks like we've got most people in now. I know we, we often have a few late latecomers, so we'll get underway. So, as I said, a very good morning to you all. Well, thank you very much for joining us this morning at this K3 Hub CPD webinar, where we'll be discussing accounting issues. For those who haven't met me before, my name is Marie Wadeson and I'm a Managing Director at Quantuma. And on behalf of our parent company, the K3 Capital Group, I lead the K3 Hub, which is a member network for professional advisors developed by us and other companies within the K3 Capital Group. By way of a bit of background, K3 Hub launched in the spring of 2021, and we're proud to boast over 2,800 members. Um, for those that don't know, K3 Hub offers a range of CPD and training sessions, not dissimilar to today's event, and referrals for certain types of work referred into our group. Um, just as a side note, our group offers a wide range of niche advisory services, which include restructuring, corporate finance, forensic accounting, R&D tax credits, and marketing services for professional services firms. Um, just moving on to a few pieces of housekeeping before we get underway and I hand you over to our speaker today. Um, so you probably notice as you join the webinar, we are recording today's session. The webinar will be posted onto the K3 Hub and Quantum websites next week, should you wish to refer back to anything. Q&A function is open, so do feel free to ask questions as we go along. Our preference is strongly that you use the Q&A function to ask these questions rather than the chat, just so that our speaker knows that he's he's got got to look in one particular place for all of it, all of the questions. Um, we are expecting quite a few questions today, and therefore we think it's probably inevitable that we're not going to be able to cover everything. Um, if we don't get around to answering the questions, uh, we'll pass your, your questions and your contact details onto the speaker and um, hopefully be able to respond separately um, after the webinar. Um, we are running some short polls today during the webinar. It would be great if you could participate. Your um, responses are anonymous, and I think some of, some of the questions are just for fun. Um, Breaks-wise, we know that today is a long session. Um, we're, we're coming in at about three hours today, so we will be taking a couple of, couple of comfort breaks of about 10 minutes each. Ralph, I think, will announce those as we get, as we get to them. Right, so on to today's webinar in that case. So I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our speaker, Ralph Tiffin. So this is his, this is Ralph's first session with the K3 Hub. So a very good morning and welcome to you, Ralph. Um, just by way of introduction to Ralph, so he is a principal of his own chartered accountancy and registered auditor firm. He provides consultancy for many companies in the UK and overseas on subjects ranging from applying IFRS through to ethics and fraud prevention. He's the author of a range of texts on accounting, auditing, and project appraisal, and is a, is a regular contributor to the CCH CPD courses and publications. Today's session will broadly cover the format of accounts, accounting standards, and the significant changes coming, company's house and HMRC requirements, your clients' business plans and what they put on their website, strategic reports for medium-sized and growing companies, including information for funders, um, before I get before I uh, hand you over, I just wanted to flag a couple of uh, K3 Hub events coming up, um, which might be of interest to you. Um, we've got tax obligations for business owners coming up in May, tax opportunities that come with expanding overseas in June, and then the people aspects of M&A coming up in July. Um, you'll find further details and a registration link on the K3 Hub website and Quantum website shortly. Um, we'll also get those invitations out in due course, so do watch out, watch your inboxes. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's session. We always like to receive feedback from you, so do feel free to, to get in touch. Um, wishing you a great weekend in, in the meantime, and I'll pass you straight over to Ralph. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good to be here. Three hours is rather daunting, but we'll look at what we have to cover, and um, let's do that right now. Right. <clears throat> the, these are the topics and it, it's not the three hours divided by seven and there, I, if you've looked at the slides you'll realize there's a lot more information that we that we just couldn't cover in the time i will try and focus on what i believe will be of use to you and um your questions will help decide that um i personally am not at all good at multitasking so i'm very likely to and the first lot of questions I will leave till the first break and have a look through and then answer them after that. Um, it, during the poll, I might have a look at the questions. It's a case of sort of breaking into the flow of things. But um, one way or other, we'll answer the questions. So what are we going to look at? 
the format of accounts, um, th th this is prescribed by the Companies Act, and I, I could say in a way there's not much in the way of change, but there are always issues, and uh, the one issue that's probably important to us all in presenting accounts and our companies is cash flow statement or uh, statements of cash flow, both terms are used. Accounting standards are obviously very significant to um, external reporting and, re uh, and also looking at someone's accounts. We, we need to understand accounting standards both as the presenter of accounts and in investigating accounts. And there are significant changes coming They're a year or two away, but we really need to plan now. Companies house requirements, the, the, there's been a lot just very recently, of course, you'll be aware the size of the companies from micro through small through to medium to large. <clears throat> and it's maybe particularly with a lot of you, the medium to large um, change in the hurdles will possibly be useful. So we'll look at those. Audited accounts. Now, <clears throat> this is where I could bore on for the three hours. And, and I won't, don't worry. Um, I... I've got slides here, which are a cut down version of a presentation to one of the professional bodies last autumn, um, because there is a lot in what auditors do that affect the presentation of company accounts. And um, as I think you, you'll realize once I get going, there's a lot that the auditing standards require auditors to do that, in a sense, require us to ask you to do. And, and there may be a lot of questions in this area. Um, I, I'm still auditing, but retiring from this. I, I, the audit world has got um, very uh, bureaucratic, I would say, of course. Um, and I think you're aware, well aware of the FRC's um, absolutely correctly view that company accounts should be properly audited. They'd like to use the word proper. So the audit accounts, what I'm going to do is go through quite a lot of slides, but dwell on issues in these slides that, that would affect an auditor, but particularly affect um, you as, I think most of you, as users of accounts or reviewers of accounts or presenting your own accounts. Um, it's very important, that, and I hope, I'm sure most of you have, a strong link with your auditors where you're audited. Um, and, and that's, again, another thing that the ISAs, the International Standards of Auditing, uh, very much encourage. So we'll, we'll come to that and more on that and on. HMRC requirements, in, in the case of presentation of accounts, they're not so much, but there are HMRC requirements and topics just now. And I, I notice it's something that Zuma deals with, of course, is R&D claims. There are changes there. And again, this is fair to say at this point, I, I am not an expert, say, in tax and all the areas, the information your clients put in websites. I'm not an expert. But... What certainly you can look at is the topics and um, coming back to R&D, it is a current topic. I, I have had quite a few clients who make R&D claims and I have to say, I've always wo wondered about them myself, not, not my clients or their claims, absolutely valid, but um, I, you have been approached with people saying, oh, can we do R&D claim? And it's just they wanted, I think, claim on routine work they're doing. So. I am not surprised that HMRC is um, looking at this area. So that's just picking on one in tax. And again, trying to present this uh, to explain how I want to present things, hopefully to help you um, and do ask questions. The information your clients put on the website, a, a few comments from me really there, and strategic reports for medium sized and growing companies, including information for funders, um, a very important area. I mean, I, I just reviewed a client's strategic report. For a lot of private companies, they are the minimum required. They don't want to disclose more than they're hiding anything, but um, they don't want to disclose more. But strategic reports are important and a very good way of selling your company, of course. I mean, I think that's an important point. So that's the last topic we look at. And as I say, I'll adjust the speed of things. I have, I, I time things to the five minutes at any presentation, but it never works out like that. And it rather depends on the questions. So 
let's get underway. But the first break, to give you something to live for, we'll have a, a break uh, at about 5 to 10. So just to let you know, um, that, that's where we'll have the first break. And, and certainly, if I haven't answered or really studied questions by then, I will look at questions that, that have cropped up and um, aim to deal with them after the event or explain why I'll have to deal with them offline, if you, if you like. So let us move on. The format of accounts set out in the 2006 Companies Act. I think we're pretty used to them. Um, I'm going to say there's not much we can do about that because they are company law, which is great. In fact, we, you know, so it's not a free for all. But there are um, a, a linked to the auditing standards and very much linked, of course, to accounting standards. There are requirements for disclosure. The, the Companies Act in the UK does not specify every accounting policy you must have or whatever. That is that's left to the accounting standards. And then behind that, if you like, is the fact that um, the ISA say, you know, you should disclose enough on estimates, a hot and popular topic. You should disclose fully why you're going concern. So the format of accounts is prescribed by law, including the the references to the FRC accounting standards and auditing standards. And I'm sure you're aware of it. But topic um and a particular topic today uh, that and there was a paper published, I haven't put the reference in, but the English Institute published a very good paper in January on the fact that um the audit reports are coming back again. The 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 inspection of audit files reports are coming back that cash flows are errors. So what are they? Non, non cash transactions included. Uh, it's easy to make that mistake. Um, inconsistencies between cash flow numbers and numbers elsewhere in the accounts and notes. And in preparing this, that panicked me and our client's accounts, which had just been audited and signed off by the directors. I had a meeting yesterday, in fact. Um, the, the strategic report discussed profit increase for the year, discussed um, level of borrowing, etc. But when it came to the figures for but underlying profit has moved this to this, you couldn't easily find it in the accounts. Well, you could actually, if you took time, it was there. But I, I was just aware, and I think this is what happens, that it's either inconsistencies or lack of clarity linking the, the strategic report is a very good example figures with which uh, page which statement in the accounts you need to look at. You have missing or incorrectly um, classified cash flows. Um, and I had I was pulled up in a file review on that. Um, I'm going to say wrongly, yes, but because there was a choice as to where um, interest paid goes. Is it to do with financing or is it an operating cost? And the, and the fact, the answer is that there is an option there that if your interest is due to the overdraft to finance your stock, it's very much an operating activity. If it's to do with total funding, then it's it's maybe a financing issue. So there are missing or incorrect, possibly classified cash flows. Inconsistency between finance and cash flows and the reconciliation, reconciliation of changes in liabilities. So again, case of going over your, your cash flow in detail, con complex um, transactions not clearly explained. Uh, uh, cash flows can be um, really complex, particularly in the group situation. So quite a lot of errors and um, a case of double checking by the directors and the auditors have to check. I'll say at this point, because I'll probably make the point again, um, the, the clients I have and the people I know are very conscientious and want their accounts to be correct. Um, we're not aimingly careless or whatever else, but you, you get the impression from some quarters of regulators that we're kind of scoundrels. All right, don't care. But yes, we do care. And but it's difficult. There are a lot of changes. The the accounting standards is an industry as far as I'm concerned. I mean weekly updates, IFRS <laughs> reminder, that there's a lot for us all to keep up up to date with. So we need to ch check things out very carefully. Um, and moving on to liquidity as actually a disclosure issue, but the one other thing was in this paper, it's very true, that cash flows very often, though you're using accounting software 
to prepare the accounts, they will prepare a cash flow. There is work that's done on spreadsheets and those spreadsheets need to be checked carefully. I mean, that is, it's absolutely the case with ones, I, the ones, ones I've been looking at that you have cash flows, movements, et cetera, analysis on, on spreadsheets. They obviously need to be checked. Liquidity is a topic um, that's cropped up annually from the FRC about poor disclosure. Um, and I think it's, it's a way maybe, maybe a bit unfair, maybe lack of disclosure would be a better term in that um, you could do a cash flow statement, you've got the balance sheet, you can compare things um, and uh, what more should you do? But liquidity would be something that should be discussed. And as uh, we're going to see later, I think, um, in going concern, how liquid is the company? Has it ready cash, et cetera? So there's something to think about. And this was the comment from the last, the latest um, FRC review. Companies could improve the disclosures on accounting policies and judgments in relation to cash flow statement. That's rather strange because it's strange in that um, you don't generally have accounting policy for a cash flow statement. You just do it. Um, judgments and and there's no particular certainly the Companies Act. There's no nothing in the accounting standards that demands a particular policy. But I can see what they're getting at. Certainly, judgments are a requirement of IFRS and FRS 102. That where judgments are made in how you account for things, disclose things, then there should be disclosure. Many of these accounts contained only boilerplate disclosures in respect to liquidity risk and related issues. There was, however, a marked improvement in going concern viability and liquidity, um, which is good to see. Th that comment, the middle comment there, is from the review of larger company accounts. Um, I'll come back. Boilerplate disclosure. I mean, what else are you to do? A lot of accounting is, and we'll, I'll have a go at them later, they, it's economist jargon. Uh, and, uh, I mean, how, how am I to improve upon the expert uh, words used in accounting standards, and I think the answer is no. So I, I'm afraid. I think at small, medium-sized companies, larger, we're going to get boilerplate disclosure. But I'm sure I, I'm aware. You're aware. We, we should all think about: Do we need to add to this? I, I nearly said embroidered, but of course that is not the thing you would do. Add to it um, and make it clear to the users of accounts. The majority of companies in the sample disclosed key liquidity information, such as the availability of cash, um, undrawn borrowing facilities, and compliance with covenants. And that, that's something I was talking yesterday to this client. And I mean, it, 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 clients, you know, I'm there preaching, sermonizing, being ultra virtuous. Um, he said to me, Well, I've got um, one million free cash. You know, if anything happens, I can cover it. You could, you, you could ask the question, well, why do you have a million free cash? But um, yeah, you know, from their point of view, there's a lot of people will say, no, well, I'm, I'm, I'm liquid. Well, maybe that, that could have been disclosed in the strategic report. We hold a balance for, for trading and liquidity and unforeseen circumstances. So cash flow, coming to the end of this, um, cash flow it, disclosures are something in format, rather, and disclosure in accounts that could be improved, apparently. So let's come to the first quiz and simple questions. Do you find accounts? Uh, because I, I appreciate there's um, lawyers, there's, of course, auditors, you should say, dead easy to follow, um, and accountants, but there, there are different people out there. I, honest answers. It would be interesting to see uh, from you experts. Do you find accounts easy to follow, require some study time, require professional help, and indecipherable? So have a go. Right, there we have the answers. Easy to follow, which is good to see. And because of the expertise, I, I would actually go on the second heading. Stranger, new accounts, whatever. Yeah, I think you need some study time. Um, and yeah, the some of us um, would certainly need professional help. It's good that they're not indecipherable. So that's, that's a positive note. I think positive all around there. But I mean, I do think these days, they, they do require some time spent on them. So 
Thank you very much. Let us move on. And just some final issues on um, accounting standards. There are perennial issues. I'll probably pick these up later in the auditing section. The impairment of assets forever apparently could be done better. People don't do 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 a you know a, a, a review of assets and impair them. And I, I hate to say, it, in today's economic climate, whatever that may be, it's kind of foggy. I've been a you know merchant of doom for the last two years with clients. Oh no, it's going to be the end of the world, recession, recession. Um, somehow we've held held off, I, and I hope it continues to be that be the case. But impairment of assets um, is certainly something we should think about. Fair value. The comment there more is that do we do the right thing? We we're meant to turn to. Um, the IFRS, though we work on UK GAAP, the IFRS has guidance, IFRS 13, on fair values. Um, it's, it's really quite an academic thing, an economist paper. I, you know, I, I like the point that they sort of talk of secondary market valuations where you can get information. You just can't for a lot of medium, large private companies, but an important area. And judgments and estimates, definitely more on that later. Right. A key bit of the morning will take us up to our break. We'll probably certainly need it. Um, accounting standards and significant changes. The periodic review, the, the FRS 102 has triennial, started out as triennial reviews and has periodic reviews of the standard. And um, this has just literally just happened. And on preparing for this, thank goodness I didn't prepare more than a week before. I was thinking about what I was going to do, but I just pressure of work. And it's good that I didn't because um, March 27th was the date of publication of the latest review. Section 1A for small entities, um, the changes there are more clarity on which disclosures are expected to be necessary. Easier for UK small entity to decide which disclosures need to be provided. The, the, the weakness on 1A, which a lot of people used was um, minimal, but 1A did say and and you and disclose more where it will be helpful. Rightly, I think FRC reviewers have said, well, tell us what this might be. So it, it, 1A has been improved. Section two concepts and pervasive principle updates to align with latest international framework, laying foundation for continued international alignment benefits including consistency and comparability, minimizing gap differences. So if you were moving from um, UK gap to IFRS as a growing company, it should not be dramatic as it would be now because the two major items coming in until this, this, this periodic review and until 2006, in fact, you, you could sell it still be working one way with leases, for instance, and IFRS would be separate, and you would therefore be a, a, not a transitioning issue. So more alignment um, with the UK gap being more closely than ever aligned with um, IFRS, international reporting standards. Right, here, here we have this, and I, I will put this to make it clear, the, the changes, um, revenue and leases, issues to consider before implementation the amendments to the publication date was 27th March um, and the red at the bottom make sure if you're doing any work on this or looking at any use the latest version um, the amendments to section 23 publication date the the, the following paragraph set out the amendments to section 23 for ease of reading revised text is not underlined um, section 24523 is retitled to revenue uh, from revenue to revenue from contracts with customers, the IFRS uh, name for it. And subheadings are deleted and replaced with the following. So um, that's just to give you a flavor that um, it, I, I, looking at it, I'm going to say it's difficult to follow, but um, it is updated and you, 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 you have to study it. I think that's the point. So revenue recognition, um, here, 
let me just move something on my screen, which is blocking and is a darn nuisance. This is um, the, the notes I have here to make it very clear. Um, I, I, I used to speak on this in IFRS and, and talked on, on UK Gap. This, this, these slides are from the exposure draft 82 version. So this would be a case if I use this now uh, for a client, I would be using out of date version. So I, I, you know, I, I wasn't going to start writing, rewriting all the slides, but the points are clear enough here on the changes section 23 retitled um, from revenue. Um, the points and, and to give you the drift of it are correct here. They just have been finessing in the latest final version that you'll be using. In the the date for introduction is 2026 from 1st January, and I can't find I couldn't find anything last night. Quickly looking whether it was accounts in the year from 1st January. I think, rather think it has to be. This um, start date is not like some others. It's maybe more the ISIS where they introduce them on the 15th of December. Uh, makes it absolutely clear it's not a December year end. But I, I do check out the start date, but it's certainly not until from 1st of January. Right. What is different here? Um, this section, I will maybe jump through some slides because there, there's more material than needed. It's not a lecture for an hour on this topic, but it's a very important part of the knowing where we are up to date on accounting standards. This section establishes a revenue recognition model, which is similar to IFRS. And what we have now are steps to identify the contract for the customer, identify the promises in the contract, determine the price, allocate the price to the promises, and recognize revenue when or as the entity satisfies the promise. Now, it's making a meal of something, but the extremes. If I go into a shop and buy a can of beans, um, I, the contract's very clear. I lift a can of beans and uh, offer to pay for it, and the, the shopkeeper wants to sell it and says, yes, fine. Um, the promise is very clear. The transaction price was on the shelf or on the can of beans. They allocate the price to the promises. Well, that's up to the, the owner knows that uh, he sold something that cost X. He sold it for, for X, and sorry, and it's cost Y and recognizes the revenue at that point, no problem. And um, where the standard will cause more problems, there's being negative, where it raises issues is I am working on a long-term contract. Um, uh, you know, I won't mention a nuclear power station because that would be ridiculous the way it changes, but it would really give an example that a long-term contract where the final price isn't known, where the costs are not known, but where the contract is known to deliver a working something, a, a, a road built, a wall built, a house built, whatever, um, then th this becomes very serious. The steps are where is the contract? Well, there'll be a legal contract. Um, identify to promise the, the promises in the contract and the price, allocate the price, etc. This is where this... Um, revised standard is going to, I'm going to say, hit us if you're involved in any of these areas at all. And, and there's many areas in between in service contracts, I and mean, just when is the point of sale, if you like. Um, service contracts, point of sale, uh, opportunity for fraud there. And we've had cases, companies sold at ridiculous valuations on the ground of sales that, well, frankly, didn't exist. So um, revenue recognition like 23 very important for preparers of accounts readers of accounts and of course auditors and um, disclosures and then to disclose re revenue it recognizes from the contract with customers that disaggregated into categories showing a minimum these separate headings the sale of goods the rendering of services interest royalties commissions etc that hasn't really changed i mean you, you would expect to disclose sales of goods in your if you had significant revenue streams from goods as opposed to services then you would have done that anyway so that's that's not such a change um the core principle is an entity recognized revenue de to depict i love the ifrs did this all the time they came up with a word 
that they hadn't used before. So to depict means to paint a picture. I think it's quite amusing. So they, we're not artists on painting pictures, but that's that's the prime meaning. Anyway, that recognizes revenue to explain the transfer of promised goods or services to, to the customers in an amount that reflects the consideration to which the entity expects to be entitled in exchange for those goods or services. An entity recognizes revenue in accordance with the core principles by applying steps. What's interesting here is if an innocent, a non-accountant, a non-expert came to this, I think you'd think it's rather woolly. And it's not meant to be, it's meant to be precise. It's an economist statement, but it does point to the fact that the expectation probability is an issue. And this is something, if, if you're used to IFRS, is not new and FRS 1 or 2 to an extent, but is quite an add-on to 102 that we're now thinking of figures as probable figures. So I will focus on that. Um, I may now skip through rapidly. Let's see. Issue a contract uh, with customers. They may have to bring lines. Yeah, I'll, I'll just talk on to this. Um, the, the point is that these slides are not notes. I normally would give a full set of notes with a talk, but I mean, there's far too much here. And my notes would not be as good as you go to the source, which is the FRS 102 or whatever document. But contracts may have to be combined. An entity will combine two or more contracts entered into at the same time with the same customer if one or more of the following criteria are met. Contracts are negotiated in the package, etc. cetera. Um, that, that just makes sense. Um, and I think a lot of people would like that. That you have, We're not explaining all the detail. It's, it's one business we've got. It's one line of business. You can combine them. The contra to this is if you if don't meet those, then you shouldn't be combining them. I think that's maybe the more important point. So um, contracts may have to be combined. Modifications are defined and there are conditions for their treatment. An entity will account for a contract modification. With these slides, I'm, I, I should have said, I'm straight into your sort of construction contract type of business. And this is not relevant to selling cans of beans, obviously. <clears throat> An entity shall account for a contract modification as a separate contract if both of the following are met um, and are, are, are present, I should say, are present. The scope of the contract increases because of the addition of promised goods. The price of the contract increases by an amount of consideration that reflects the entity's standalone selling price of the additional promise. So <clears throat> you can't lose modifications and just put them in the contract. On the ha other hand, you shall account for them as separate um, headings. What the detail of the, the FRS 1 and 2 probably <clears throat> does cover, the modifications are in practice. I mean, construction contracts were my thing when I started auditing all these years ago. I, I, I didn't see and bore you with my introduction. I started out as a mechanical engineer commissioning power stations, coal-fired power stations, a lot of them. I, I got very depressed that power stations were that I commissioned or was involved in commissioning. I didn't commission a part of a team, um, were being pulled down. I, and I thought, well, oh, that's just sad, but it's good I'm outliving power stations. Um, anyway, the, the power station is a good example that <clears throat> modifications can be of two types. And one is where you are entitled to claim variation income. We'll come on to that. So I, I would classify, classify them as variations where. It's in the contract, you can charge, and the clients ask you to modify. So a modification is a variation charge. There are modifications which are because are caused by the contractor screwing up, and in which case that's just a cost to them. And they, they might try for variation income and whatever. That's all about negotiating. But modifications are defined in the standard. Um, how perform performance obligations, uh, how many are there? Um, at the outset, you're meant to look and see are the goods or services separate, distinct goods or services. This is it. I'll speed through these. Um, deter de determining the transaction price, the nature, timing, and amount of consideration of the customer affects the estimate of the estimate of the transaction price. What do we have to do when determining the transaction price? You shall consider all the effects of variable consideration. Constraining estimates, and that's a term used in the standard, non-cash consideration, um, 
yeah, sometimes the you know land or buildings or things, equipment passes during the life of a contract and the consideration payable to a customer. But the important things that you know, I'm focusing on and will are the variable consideration and whether they should be constrained or not. <clears throat> and variable amounts have to be estimated. And, and th this is an example of accounting standards today, very much <clears throat> dogmatic is too strong a word, but very much and very clear on what should be done. An entity has to net the amount of variable income using one or two methods, um, which the one which is better expected to predict the amount, the outcome. <coughs> Excuse me. A, the expected value, the sum of probability weighted amounts in a range of possible consideration amounts. This really is, you know, I, I can't keep blaming economists. That this is, um, it, it's not. There is an invoice. We're going to bill them, and that's it. I mean, we're 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 doing some sums here. There's arithmetic involved and probability, which aims rightly. That's what the standard is saying to give a better figure. I mean, a truer figure, if you like. But of course, opens it up to abuse and error. Not as auditing is meant to look for. We look for errors, material errors in accounts, but also, um, of course, fraud. Or the most likely amount is the single most likely amount in a range of possible consideration amounts. So that this, this choice there for people to choose, I, I suppose they could choose the, the range, but um, there is one best. And I, I actually would hope that would be the case for a lot of situations. <clears throat> Does... Um, Revenue have to be constrained. An entity shall include in the transaction price some or all of the amount of variable consideration estimated in accordance with paragraph 53 earlier, and the extent that it's highly probable that a significant reversal of the cumulative revenue recognition will not occur. Okay, so what is all this about? <clears throat> I think I'm best to explain it, the, it, the issues here and a very interesting point on culture in accounting globally, and th this is a point will be a point for local, a lot of you are well aware. I'm sure trading globally or hoping to trade globally, um, cultures affect things. Right uh, to me, the, the situation was amusing, but it explains uh, and to me it also explains the danger of this probability issue. Um, it talks about highly probable. Well, the definition of highly probable is in accounting standards. First came in in IFRS, and probable is probable means that something is more likely than not. So if it's fifty-one percent chance of happening, it is probable. Very clear. Um, you wonder about it, but um, what does it's um, highly probable mean? And and to me, it's a rather woolly answer. It's, and the, the story I'm going to tell will make the point. Significantly more likely than probable. So highly probable is significantly more likely. So what does that mean? Right. A, a few years, about 10 years back, I was speaking to a group of Russians in uh, Barcelona. Why were they there? Because it's a nice place to go to, and I was happy to speak there. Um, but it, it, it and was then very sensible. It was a good venue. They were wanting to study IFRS, International Accounting Standards. There were 15 of them, um, majority ladies, actually. Um, and working for Gazprom, all the big names, they came, you know, IFRS was important and very nice people. So we got to, and it was a talk on the, the IFRS, the IRS parallel to FRS 102. And we came to the question of this highly probable, what did it mean? And so my, my question posed them was, you have variation income that's significant, you know, 100 is the contract value and the variation income could be 30. So, I mean, it's really, really significant. And what are their chances of you getting it? Um, and, and what each year as your contract progresses do you include in the accounts? Well, it's not just that it's probable you'll get it. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll certainly get most of it. Um, it's got to be, you know, highly probable. What does that mean? So I asked them in a range, and 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 I said, I, you know, I tell you what I think we do in 
the UK and other Australia to work on contracts. Um, I, I said, well, if it was 60% portable, would you book it, i.e. take it in? And, uh, yeah, okay, I thought about that. It, what if it was 70% probable that you would get the lot or most of it? Oh, yeah, that that's, well, it seems likely. 80%, yeah, well, sure, 90, yeah, 100, obviously. But 90, absolutely. So it's really the range 50, 60, and 70 were, you know, we were focusing on. Well, 50 is dismissed by this requiring the highly probable. So what I'm saying is, does highly probable mean if something 60% likely you take it in, or do you have to wait to 70, or some of you wait to 80? Um, so I explained, I thought, in the UK, you know, technical people, engineers, etc., tend to, tend to be traditionally prudent. Um, they might have pressure from the finance people, but they tend to be prudent. A lot would wait till 80. I mean, they were, you know, and I want to be really certain, 80, uh, you know, they'd agree at um, 70. I think they'd be seen as pushy at 60. Um, so I said, what would you do? And, you know, it was one of these things they could vote, and they voted, and they voted, oh, we'd do it at 50. Well, why? Because it's more likely than not. And what I've got to now tell you is the interesting thing is most of them were economists in the top jobs. And I said, at the introduction, I said, you seem to all be economists. Uh, I said, why? And they said, oh, well, um, I said, who does? You do accounting, the accountants. Oh, that's just the accountants waving their hands. <laughs> just the bean counters are dismissed. <laughs> so I, obviously, totally different culture, but interesting, a different attitude. And that is something as boards you're <clears throat> going to have to deal with if you're in any industry adopting this revenue standard. That's really my point to say for the morning um i'll come back to this whole question of governance and boards and whatever um certainly in the medium and smaller um, so medium and more, uh, larger companies but even smaller companies the it, we are informal um family business it's growing it's informal it does well i mean I, this is what gets me i i get questioned on you know, your auditing of these clients you to tell them to do this that and the other um when they're doing very well, thank you, but there's not the formality. More formality is required, and I would certainly say there has to be internal documentation on this definition of highly probable. Um, otherwise, well, you, you, you're not going to get true and fair figures and accounts at the end of the day. It would be, and I'm sure it's something you do and the lawyers and others involved in due diligence. I would certainly be asking, you know, how, why have you booked this variation income? So it's topical now, never mind becoming more topical in the future. Um, so, um, significant finance components should be identified. So where um, the transaction price includes a promised amount of consideration for the effect of the time value of money and the timing of payments, then that has to be brought in. So how will I describe this? More sophisticated accounting. Um, the... the and, and I think anyone, again, looking at a contractor working on a major contract, what do the um, <clears throat> what do the progress payments mean? Are they only funding what they've spent money on, the <clears throat> contractor you spent money on, or are they funding the business? So um, important, these are identified and, and disclosed properly. Um, the performance obligations, uh, the objective of this step is to set out in paragraph 73 as and other steps. The requirement for the allocation of the transaction price could result in a change in the practice for many entities. Again, this, this is maybe picking up on the fact that the point I said earlier. I think that this, I don't know, I think, I know I, on the introduction of the IFRS, um, more formality is needed. Um, maybe exactly what you do now, but um, clarity of what you do at stages on different types of contract, it certainly needed. Um, allocating the price, um, this, uh, gosh, uh, examples in this, the transaction price, just to sum it up, is generally allocated in a proportion to the standalone selling price on a related or relevant standalone selling basis. With some of the examples you get in in the actual standard and the full IFRS, I would disagree with some of the allocating arithmetic. You, you tend to go, you tend to use hindsight to revisit things. Um, 
a tricky area possibly. But the, 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 in, in simple words, it's meant to generally allocate in proportion to the standalone selling price on a related or relative standalone basis. Um, it becomes more messy where you have three linked contracts, say, and there are some fixed costs. Where do they go? It, it, it's, it is more sophisticated there. That's positive. Uh, issue standalone prices are needed. Um, and, the, and, and in fact, you're asked to find standalone prices, though you as a contractor haven't got them. Uh, you can't find them directly. Again, you're meant to look to adjusted market assessment approach, an expected cost plus margin approach, a residual approach. And, you know, I, I have to mention economists. This is really, a lot of you will be used to this. This came in with years ago, certainly in IFRS. Um, you know, you have to go and look and ask what is an adjusted market assessment approach. The expected cost plus a margin approach would be what a lot of us do and probably will continue to do. But more detailed, more sophisticated is certainly what the revenue the recognition standard is bringing to it. Issue allocation of variable income. <clears throat> I, I think I've, I've said enough on that, so we'll skip on from this. Uh, recognize revenue when an entity satisfies the performance obligation. An issue, does your customer have control over the promised goods or services or only the risk and reward? Is there a difference? Um, is a, a good question. Um, it, it's when you satisfy a performance obligation. In a lot of cases, that will be contractual and absolutely clear. There'll be a handover certificate, obviously at the end of the contract, but the, the architect's certificates as you progress on building a, a building, um, there will be independent evidence and of the contractual stages. So it shouldn't be a problem. So, you know, I don't want to make too much of all of this, but there are, are issues. Um, when can income be booked? Um, the, I, the ISB, in the basis of conclusions for IFRS, said the criteria to identify a sale at a point in time over, as, a, as opposed to overtimes, clarify that in pure service contracts, entities will gen, generally transfer services over time. That's hardly deep, and at least they came to a conclusion. Um, I, I think it is probably, there. I'm using the word, it is likely that a service contract, you, you supply a service, so many days work, weeks work, whatever else, at stage, uh, we're moving to a stage, but a lot of service contracts over time. And uh, the new statement, moving on to leases. So I will look out for questions and all of this or um, indication at, at, at the break. Let me turn my script on and check up on time. Leases. And I think I'll start on this and we'll, we'll get to a quiz and it'll be time for a break. You'll be relieved to know. Um, why a new standard? And that's me again. Accounting has been hijacked by economists because FRS 1 or 2 demands the change. That's it. <clears throat> what are the changes? All leases, the, the word is that all leases create assets and liabilities. Leases provide a source of financing. Thus, if there's an asset, a lessee obtains an asset and incurs a liability when it enters into a lease. Right. The, yesterday, it was great. I was do, we're talking to this client uh, and has a chain of um, licensed premises, nightclubs, etc. And um, so I'm leased. And this change had to be explained that this was coming up, not this year, not next, probably even the year after, but um, coming up. And wonderful business person, great, great successful business. This is just nuts, basically response and so i have to carefully explain it and yeah i i can see two views from it i can see, i can certainly understand the traditional view that a lot of you may face you may have yourselves your clients if you're the lawyers they may have uh, we'll all have views is that no i lease the thing i don't own it um yes i have the right to use it and that's valuable uh, i pay the money um but what value do I put in the balance sheet? And, and that is interesting. I think I'll deal with this now because it probably crops up in one of the headings, but deal with it now, uh, just one or two more and then a quiz and then a break. Um, 
leases I, I've always found fascinating that you've got a full repairing lease with rent reviews. Um, it, and, 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 and of course, if you run a successful business in premises, then the rent review is, it, 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 never mind inflation, is going to go up because it's a, 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 they are premises that if you quit the lease, the landlord, the owner could sell to a higher price because it's a successful site. I mean, we just had, had that with a company. I was involved in a restaurant, wretched thing, lost money, but uh, it, everybody wants to own a restaurant, of course. Um, but, you know, you so you enhance the value of the lease property you're renting and you pay for the privilege. Uh, maybe that's right. I, it, it's, it's economically, it's, it's fascinating. But when we come to the standard, it gets really interesting that you are actually saying that the lease payment are um, finance cost and you get an asset at the present value of those lease payments at the commencement. This is the start date. And that figure, even that figure may be wrong. You could have bought a pup, as it were. You could have leased premises just before COVID um, in the city of London for a thar. Well, I mean, I was walking around there when you were allowed to um, in Ghostland, um, empty premises. Um, would they ever open? There's one, I think of one that's not the city, it, it's still sitting empty. It was a successful Italian takeaway place. Um, if they'd signed the lease before COVID, fine, the, the value of the present cost of the lease, the asset was you had was worth it. I mean, you, you have the use of the place and we're going to sell whatever you sold. But um, you could enter into a lease, you could have a lease, and this counting standard comes in, you've immediately got to impair the asset. So it could cause problems. That, and, and that's why my conversation yesterday, it, it, you know, it's, you're looking at it, you think it's mad. But weaknesses in the present system, why do we need this standard? And this is the positive notice to why we need it. <clears throat> Existing account agreement leases makes comparisons between entities difficult. That, that's true. And IFRS is looking to the market so that stock exchanges, people can pick up accounts and compare. So it's a, a very laudable, noble thing to do. And this lack of required further information makes it difficult to make comparisons. Well, that could be improved. And... You, you do have disclosures in in um, accounts on what your lease commitments are, but and you could ask for more. So that, that could be answered that way. The significance of the missing information varies by industry, country, and between entities. Again, this is all IFRS. Absolutely correct. Um, international accounting, I can pick up accounts from any country and I can make comparisons. The effect on reported gearing or le leverage may be substantial. Absolutely, could be. And that, that is an issue we're going to come to. So there are very good noble reasons for doing this. Um, at the level of the private company, uh, we, we've got to explain it carefully. It, it's interesting exercise, and it? it does make people think about what we're paying for lease, what we might pay, what is the value of the asset we're using? Can we get more out of it? That, that would be a positive drive, if you like. So... Leases should be on the balance sheet. The basic premise is that all leases should be on the balance sheet. You may have to explain this to shareholders and explain it to yourself, in fact. So let's have a quiz and then let's have a break. So here's the quiz. Right, <clears throat> quite interesting, definitely. Um, yep, I am auditors. I wonder who's, and <laughs> it'd be good to know who's answering. I mean, not the people, the, the, the profession, if you like. And then maybe, yes. So, what we're getting there, we're getting 27, 18, 35, and unlikely 35, and absolutely not. And the, the, yeah, that's going to be the thinking of a lot of people and just a nuisance. Um, yeah, the jury maybe not out, but um, we have to live with this. It's the way it goes. I think we have to make the most of it. And 
I would say the one thing is it's an interesting academic exercise at least does maybe make people really think about these days will it drive people to buy if they can um, if they can get the money possibly but um we'll leave leases here we'll come back to leases and, and i think skip too quickly because i think you've got the point and we have a year or two to go but let's have a break there i have a chance to look at uh, questions or the chat if there's anything and let's meet back at um, 10 past. You're going to have 13 minutes just now. I have time to look at questions, so definitely start back at 10 past. Thank you. Right, good morning again. Let's start back. Are there exemptions to all of this? And the answer is yes, for assets um, under 12 months, there are exemptions. The exemptions are not, I'm going to say, worth a lot. Most things are caught. Um, the values of some services and uh, whether they should include a 12 months or whatever, the value that ISB had, I think, was the ISB had was $5,000. So don't look for major ex um, exemptions. There aren't any really. A good question from the first half that I am going to answer is, I mean, obviously quite a dramatic change to the balance sheet and, and metrics measurements you'd use for performance, et cetera. I will come to the, the topic. Yes, this, this standard will have major repercussions if you like. Right. What do we need to look at the measurement of the um, leased liabilities? <clears throat> a lessee would measure leased assets and liabilities at the present value of future lease payments. Leased assets also include any costs directly related to entering into the lease. Once you get over the fact that leases have to go on the balance sheet, asset and contra liability, the measurement should not be too subjective and there is plenty of guidance. Um, but this still will be an estimate from an the ISA perspective, what I'm saying there is from the auditing standard um, perspective, so auditors should be interested in this and will be. Um, but the arithmetic is simple enough. It is but arithmetic. Links with statements of cash flow. A lessee would classify cash payments for the principal portion of the principal portion of the lease liability within financing activities and cash payments for the interest portion of the lease liability in accordance with the requirements relating to other interests paid. So, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's the effect on the cash flow, it's recognizing that you've taken out a loan and you've bought an asset. I mean, that's the principle behind this. Never mind it's substance over form would be the term that was used a lot. And what this, the standard set is saying, look, the substance of this is for the long term lease of a property, you're buying it. it for a period and effectively you've committed as you would to a loan to repaying money so that's the principle and it affects um cash flows as you might expect um definition frs wanted to contains a definition of a lease and accompanying guidance to help entities assess whether a contract is or contains a lease the definition and accompanying guidance will apply to both parties of a contract to the lessee and lessor um, and it, the, the term expression used you'll hear is the customer requires the right to use an item for a period of time when entering into a lease. So it's the right to use is a, a term you quite often hear. Um, distinction uh, from uh, the past, leases are different from service contracts, uh, from the past from service contracts. Leases are different from service contracts because at the start of the lease, the customer obtains control of a resource, the right to use an item. Um, the definition of company guidance focuses on whether a customer controls the use of an item. And the explanation is a customer controls the use of an item when the customer has exclusive use of the item for a period of time and can decide how to use it. So that you know should settle any arguments, but no doubt there will be areas where questions arise. But the this the standard and FRS one or two is the, the, the latest version, again, if use of the 102, if it's UK gap, 
um, the standard is very clear and has, has I've got to say, helpful, useful definitions. And there's a, uh, there's a, another, that is the definition. If you like, a contracting phase of the customer, the right to use an asset for a period of time in exchange for consideration. Um, something which seems to be fairly settled, it was quite an issue because PFI and these sort of contracts were new. I'm talking, you know, I've been around a wee while and these were new and uh, um, political and IFRS was dealing with the issue and they still remain an issue. When accounting for contracts with lease and service components, a lessee would separate the amounts of the lease and the services being available information, including estimate, using, sorry, using available information, including obviously estimate. A lessee would then recognize on the balance sheet only amounts that relate to the lease. If the service components of contract are small, an entity might make an election to account for all the entire contracts as a lease. So the, 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 there's, there's a lot of established practice there now. When, I mean, I was speaking of the IFRS, the IFRS is were new. And in fact, interesting, the adoption of IFRS in the UK and Europe even later, um, was after other countries. The first time I hit this was in the Middle East. The Middle East actually, um, with the Emirates, Saudi, et cetera, they, they I, I think, believe, had debates, should they use U, US GAAP, which would have made a lot of sense, oil, link, or um, international standards, which were, I say, British-based, they still are. They are the base here, but they are international. And they decided on IFRS. So IFRS has been around a long time, um, and a lot of practice is established. So I think the, the, the question of if you're providing um, a, a facility plus services for a period of time, the least accounting for that is well established from a practical point of view. That's what I'm really getting at. Um, lesser accounting, the lesser accounting basically remains unchanged, but not totally, but um, the lesser um, leased out an asset that so remains unchanged. Oops, sorry. It did say I want to get through things quickly, but not quite so quickly. Um, the presentation of leased liabilities, uh, what do the boards decide in contracts? And uh, in contrast, an IFRS lessee would make this distinction if that were relevant to the financial position. Um, no prescription to prescribe any particular presentation for leased liabilities, except that, well, right, sorry, I'm, I'm whittling on here, absolutely. The presentation, you're going to follow the practice for uh, loans, if you like, the, the established FRS 102 uh, practice for financial instruments. Um, so no, 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 no real issues there. Presentation of leased assets would present the leased assets on the balance sheet together with own property, plant and equipment, if not presented as a separate line item or as their own line items, if that were relevant to understanding. I would absolutely say, and I haven't checked, I have, this is where I must say, I have not checked, and you must check this March 27th, just hot off the press edition, the final version. I, I, I found, always found it a bit strange that I, I would say they should be shown as a separate line to, to make clear the position. I, I think most people will do that. So um, that, that needs to be checked out. Effects on the income statement. Um, basically, instead of having lease charges, you're going to have an interest charge and a, a, a depreciation charge of the asset you now own. Um, I could be simplistic and say it shouldn't, the net effect shouldn't be very much, but it obviously, this is a point in the question I had was very good. I mean, changes where things land on the PL account interest. Operating cost depreciation is not a cash movement, so it affects the cash flow in that sense. Um, depreciation is a cost of the business, fine, an operating cost, but interest charge is a separate line, and you could have your metrics, your measurement of EBITDA, whatever, it, as defined, or other measures at different levels. So you, what you recognize is amortization of leased assets separately from interest on leased liabilities. So amortization or depreciation are separate. It, it does cause changes and causes changes to the layout, which is very important. Um, commercial effects of new IFRS 
One effect is the importance of efficient, and this falls, I mean, I have the question asked, possible lower or higher risk premiums. This, this, is, this is going back a year or two, this slide, but, uh, but when the IFRS was introduced, one effect they noticed is the importance for the efficient functioning of capital markets for a full understanding of credit risk. I would have thought they've got this by now, um, and, and I, I don't want to preach to the those that know too well. More information, revelation uh, of liabilities, gearing, etc. The one thing that is affected, of course, is gearing. And um, this, at the time, the issue has been well signposted for all the years that capitalising leases have been on the agenda. The changes to lease account could affect some debt covenants. You bet it will. They could also result in some entities no longer complying with debt covenants. And that's the important one. Interestingly, the UK banks, I think they said, well, internationally, banks said, oh, we're aware of this, don't worry. <laughs> uh, if you, I, 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 I think you would absolutely have to, when you move in this accounting, you need to dust down your covenants and see what they say. And they may be very clear that it's, it's the leverage or the gearing as normally accounted for. And you maybe need to ask them to change the covenants. So that, that is, an, is a very important point, a very good question. So there I will finish on leases because, um, you, you know, there's, there's a lot of detail. You, if you're involved in this as accountants, auditors will have been in courses, will be going in courses, will be studying it. It's, there's a lot of arithmetic, a lot of disclosure issues. Um, it's moved an IFRS. I, I, I can't say painlessly, but I mean, it's accepted. And as in the quiz, a lot of people said it doubted it'll help. We've got, we'll get global consistency. So let's leave that there. But if there are questions, do, um, do ask or leave them. Right. Um, a summary. The new lease IFRS, that was IFRS, but the new leasing standard means significant changes, changes to the financial statement. Shareholders, investors need to get aware of the changes. FRS 102 need to be studied carefully. Um, and there's substantial but not complete coverage and um, comes out bit convergence with IFRS. I've, I've said all that enough. Right. Financial reporting, companies' house requirements. And again, absolutely hot off the press in the just announced a week or so back. Um, but let's visit these. Greater powers to query information requests supporting evidence, which we've never really had. Stronger checks on company names, which obviously never did happen. And we've had uh, people, uh, you know, sort of pretending to be or related to something else. I think it was a chain of restaurants or something, actually. Um, new rules for registered office addresses um, and the key ones, no post office boxes. Requirement for all companies to supply an email address, which, uh, you know, what gets, well, yeah, um, I, you know, I think a lot of us give companies have an email address. Uh, a requirement for all companies to confirm they're forming a company for a lawful purpose when incorporating and uh, and confirm it intended use and will be lawful on their confirmation statement. So an annual statement. What is this like? Uh, what What's it for? It seems to be, it, I, it always amused me going to the States, you had to, one of the questions that you've never been in the Nazi party or something like that, it was some term, you know, for obvious reasons and history, but it was picked out. Other things, bad things you might have been, weren't mentioned. But of course, there's cases, if you sign that, you're found to be, then it's very clear courts and the law, what it can do. So I, I think here, I presume I'm not the lawyer. It's the same thing that you're actually saying. It's a lawful purpose. It's making it very clear. Um, I get, that's the only reason I can see, which is a good reason. No. The ability to annotate the register when information appears confusing or misleading. So the fact companies house can put things on the register. Taking steps to clean up the register using data matching to identify and remove inaccurate information. And sharing data with other government departments and law enforcement agencies. Um, I don't know quite what that means. I, I would have thought they did that now. And then certainly all, the beauty of um, UK company law and com companies house particularly, I, I think, is that it, we have access to it as individuals. And, and you, you can track down directors and when things were formed. Um, undoubtedly, 
the, there's more information you can get, but sharing with other government parts is inevitable. Um, some of us would maybe worry about that, but I, I think it, it's inevitable. So there are those. These are significant changes. Um, should they? Should we be concerned? Um, we and and the company's house. I, I haven't put the references on the slides, but if you search company's house, there's the company's house blog, and it really is good. It's not it's not your usual blog of idle chit chat or someone replying. I know nothing about this, and then giving you a half hour and what they think. Um, it is a blog which asks a question. The company's house give an answer. So um, they have a blog, and it, it helps on the areas of the new rules for registered office addresses. Requirement for all companies to supply a registered email address and what new lawful purpose statements are about. So there, there, there's backup data for you if you're interested in this in detail. But looking at individual items that are important, from March 2024, there'll be a new rule for registered office addresses. That means companies must have an appropriate address. Again, this is a thing these days, government globally pass law down to entities, uh, I mean, audit regulations one, the FCA, the FRC, regulators for water, whatever else. Um, and often instead of having clear law, they leave it to them to have the rules. And I mean, there we have it, there'll be new rules. And that's, this is from companies how for registered office addresses. The appropriate worries me, I mean, what's appropriate? And the appropriate address is one, it is at last explained, where any document sent to the registered office should be expected to come to the attention of a person acting on behalf of the company. So that means, to, to me, that means a live office. Um, any document sent to that address can be recorded by an acknowledgement of delivery. So again, not just on a shelf, but um, signed for, etc., which they could do now. These changes mean you will not be able to use a, a PO box as your registered office address from 4th March. You can still use a third party agent's address if they meet the conditions. So, um, you know, an office, I, I can imagine an office as an accountant, you had an office in a small town and you keep it, but the mail's just deposited there and it's collected once a week, even that may not be good enough. It, to me, this is, is implying a live office where documents can be opened and dealt with sooner than later. Um, but the more appropriate, um, well, this, no doubt there'll be incidences and maybe appropriate will be clarified even further. And um, I don't think it's a problem for most of us because we, you know, we, we would expect the registered office to be somewhere where goods are, goods, documents are opened and looked at. No PO box address. If you currently use a PO box address, you need to change by 4th March. 24. Well, it's a bit late. You can change your company's registered office address online using the, your authentication author, author, code, get the word right. Um, companies that do not have an appropriate registered office could be struck off. And presumably, they'll tell us when we identify an inappropriate registered office address, we'll change it to a default address held at company's house. The company must then provide an appropriate address with evidence of a link to that address within 28 days. If we do not receive the evidence, we'll start the process of drag off. Um, it'd be interesting if anyone wants to have it put in the chat, have you had a note from company's house? Because I mean, presumably they're going, it's not gonna be difficult for them, it'll take time I would imagine, but they can go through all registered companies that have a PO box address and they'll be getting in touch with us. So uh, quite a blight for a lot of people I would imagine. Registered email address. From 4th March, there'll be a new requirement for all companies to give a registered email address to company so, um, And th that will not be published on the public register. Um, new companies will need to give a registered email address when they incorporate um, and email companies when they file their next confirmation statement. So you don't need to rush to do that, but any from now on, certainly from now on, from 5th March, in fact, our online services will prompt you to apply an a email address. We'll use that email address to communicate with you about your company. So it's important you use an appropriate one. Again, appropriate. Um, you'll be able to change your registered email address through an update um, site on the site, update point on the site. Companies will have a duty to maintain an appropriate registered email address in the same way as their registered office address. 
a company that does not do it will be committing an offence. And no doubt you could dig into what that is and fines or whatever else. So um, I don't think an issue for us because, I mean, all the companies I know are involved in, we have a registered email address. Because the e-reminders are very useful. Make sure you file your your confirmation statement and your accounts, etc. So not a big deal, but um, will be an issue for a few people. And the statement of lawful purpose. When you incorporate a company, um, the subscribers, the shareholders, will need to confirm the confirm, con need to confirm confirm they're forming the company for a lawful purpose. You'll also need to confirm the company's intended future activities are lawful on the confirmation statement. So that's an annual thing. The intention of these new statements is to make it clear that all companies in the register, new and existing, have a duty to operate in a lawful way. We may take action against your company if we receive information that confirms you're not operating lawfully. <laughs> and presumably from the earlier slide, they'll be telling HMRC or someone that the unlawful things are going on. We will not accept your documents if these statements have not been confirmed. So good, I mean, it's, it's not onerous unless you're doing unlawful things. Um, it you know, makes sense. Statement of lawful purpose, existing companies will need to make it, uh, blah, blah, online services will prompt you to make the statement. That's a repetition, sorry. Um, a quick quiz, uh, let's say this, Going to be easy it's going to be 100 percent surely uh, do you think these changes will cause difficulties inconvenience no real problems There we go. Yeah, no real problems, I think. I, I would say that. Uh, yeah, and I would agree with an inconvenience. And and there will be some difficulties who totally, um, properly have um, PO boxes and they're not doing anything wrong and they get the stuff sent on and whatever else. Um, it's a service offered, so I can see it being a blight. Um, a very interesting one, I, I always think, is that a lot of people have their home as their flat, maybe at the flat particularly, as a registered office, when, of course, the, the lease or the title deeds forbid this. <laughs> so maybe a time to sort that out as well. But um, no, I mean, th these changes are a, a pest maybe, but um, they do make sense. Right, let's move on. More importantly for us, maybe very significant for some um, turnover limits for companies increasing the size. These are expected to come in, I think, the dates 24th of October. Um, before an election, after an election, who knows, but um, imminently. Um, the size thresholds have remained as they are for quite a while. Micro entities will move from not more than 632,000. Uh, I think that became that funny number because of euro is equivalent. But anyway, now we have around a million pounds. Small companies will increase from 10.2 to 15 million, and medium companies' thresholds will increase from 36 to 54. It's interesting. I've had a lot of clients, I mean, not auditing large clients at all, uh, one or two medium, but in the last, only the last three years, I think even due, even in spite of COVID, they were growing. Quite a few companies moved from the small to the medium. It's maybe the last five years. So this may be um, uh, quite significant to a lot of you that you will remain um, small companies, which uh, the burden of reporting, etc., is quite a bit less. And it also means medium companies. Where I had one client that moved to medium, and then because of COVID, they did very valuable work. They were not in any way scoundrels or rogues, um, they did excellent work for NHS and others. Um, they moved into the medium for years, as it were, and I almost hit the, the large. So the thresholds could be very useful, uh, helpful, in, except if you want to say you're a medium company, but you know the, the requirements, it's a bit more work to be done. But the turnover limits um, are very likely to go up. Balance sheet totals, 
um, there are the conditions you've got to be below two of the, the conditions. Um, micro entity um, balance sheet totals 500,000, small 500 to 7.5, medium 18 to 27. Uh, you, you could get caught that you're over those because you're asset rich for whatever reason, but at least they're increasing. And medium sized companies, the there is the talk, but this is still being looked at. So it's not certain for the date of October, if that is the date anyway. Uh, then govern, government's in consulting on whether the threshold for maximum number of employees um, for a medium sized company would increase from 250 to 500. Um, interesting, I mean, that might be critical for some of you out there. It will also consult in exempting medium sized companies from producing a strategic report and taking smaller public interest entities out of audit tendering and rotation requirements. So, um, interesting there. I would have thought if you're a medium company, you would quite like to produce a strategic report as it's part of your marketing. You know, it's not just financial reporting, but uh, um, there's been nothing to stop you producing a strategic report. But that's a further change to, to keep your eye open for. Okay. Now we move to audit accounts and you, you get a break in a while, not for quite a while, but you do get a break at 11 or so just after. Um, but I can now talk for three hours on this. Right. The point is, I am definitely going to be skipping through slides here. I haven't, I haven't really marked the ones yet. I mean, I rehearsed last night, but I know the points not to cover. How does this integrate with financial reporting today? And the answer is very much so. That um, you directors, uh, preparers of accounts, and of course auditors for that matter, but this is not an audit CPD as it were, but I hope it is of use to, to you out there. Um, auditing affects uh, financial reporting very much so. And what is interesting as an auditor is that, of course, we haven't got um, ARGA. They were going, I mean, we've got this idea of a new body, the FRC, um, being taken over. That's been shelved. Um, will it come back? A different government, a new government, the same government? I don't know. Um, but the, the side to it that wasn't enacted, if you like, the FRC has got all the powers it needs, and some would say far too much, but regarding audit regulation and quality, and certainly rightly looking for quality. But the 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 position of company directors um, and responsibilities still remains vague. It's not vague, it's in Companies Act, but um, there are directors, and you find this in the small and medium companies, um, they're not... <laughs> I love the terms they use now and things are not bad people. They're not bad at all. But, you know, they, they, they're running a good business. It's growing. The, their duties to do this, that and the other um, are, are secondary to running a good business. Well, we auditors like to understand their understanding of the business, their responsibilities, their internal control. So it's those areas I want to look at, which a good company should spend time on. Um, and I mean, it, certainly if the, a company sells up, it, it, it's got a selling point if it says, look, we have these procedures in place. And of course they do. Often they're in place, but not documented. And that, that's something, again, I was just talking about yesterday. It's actually documenting things. So um, the, an understanding of the audit process today is important for all of us. Um, I, let's look at some slides. Right. We'll start with a quiz, though, just, again, purely for fun. Do you find your audit very helpful, somewhat helpful, of little value and annoyance? <laughs> of course, it could be an annoyance and helpful, but <laughs> if you, you answer them just as the words they are. <laughs> that was quite a good, um, quite a good spread. It's good to see very helpful, and um, I think that's what we orders as aim to be is helpful. And some of us are only somewhat helpful, but we do try. Um, of little value, that comes back 
quite often, a lot of the time, and I'm sure they are an annoyance. But I'll stick with the majority that uh, 30, well, the majority there um, goes for they are um, useful. Okay, so we, and we have to have them. So they might be a little value or annoyance, but I'm afraid you're stuck with them unless you can become a small company. Ah, and that's one thing I, I meant to say. Um, I, I'm looking desperately and an English Institute page was helpful in that it said, we're not discussing the question of whether the audit limit goes up with the jump to 15 million. I presume it does. If you small companies do not require an audit, but they can have one if they want to or, or for other reasons, certainly if the directors vote. But um, it, it would be good for a lot of um, small companies that move to medium, where, which, which don't expect to dramatically rise in size, that they don't need an audit. That, I can't find clarity that that will be the case. Just, just that's just a point. By the way. So let's move on. Um, what do I want to cover here? Um, you know, pages and stuff. The authority of the ISAs and FRT. ISAs are the financial statements of, uh, on auditing. FRC is the National Reporting Council. Weaknesses found in inspections. So, I mean, I. I suffer from inspections, rightly so. It's about quality of audits and, you know, people, the thorough inspections and comment. The, the weaknesses in inspections, are, I, I would like to take not just as weaknesses of the auditor, but weaknesses in the preparation of the accounts and the process. And that's why I'm sharing it with I, everyone, I think, needs to be more involved who's concerned about running a company properly. And this is all about audit quality management. Um, ISA 200, conduct of an audit. Uh, professional judgment is an interesting topic. It um, a paper produced by the FRC, and I'm going to look at some key points of it because most certainly professional judgment is a, an audit auditor's um, skill or not, but needed by auditor. But it's also in the FRC that the paper is there for directors as well who make professional judgments on the accounting standards they use. I, I, if they've got a choice on the accounting policies they use most certainly um skepticism is what we should all be skeptical and um, um and yesterday you're checking the slides um for two as i said oh this it's spelled differently it was it a Ill illegal required as it were you know wasn't a standard term the answer is no different people use k and some use c and in my notes they change so skepticism is skepticism um group audits of groups um I'll just mention changes that have occurred in auditing there, and that they, they, therefore they may affect you if you're involved in a group. Support when auditing judgment, that's the paper, uh, Professional Judgment Guidance, page 29, which I think there are points we, we all maybe should be interested in for financial reporting. ISA 315, um, first time implementation guide, um, the, the IFAC is the International Federation of Accountants. Um, ISA 315, I will look at because it's really now at the heart of auditing. It's a whole question of, as an auditor, what, what do you do? And I, I, it has a very important thing, uh, concept for directors and owners of companies is what are your risks, as if you didn't know. But it's it's really probably very sensible. What are the risks in your, in your business? And a, a bit of a thing of mine, scalability considerations that there is, there's a strong view that um, the the standards are too much of them. I mean, they run to pages, there's endless requirements, should be able to scale down. There is an international paper on um, a single standard for the audit of less complex entities, LCEs, which is meant to be helpful in that it um, puts everything in one book and is focused on small entities. The FRC have no particular interest in, the, interest in this, it would seem. They, I mean, it hasn't been rushed to be adopted here. Um, does it help? Well, I wonder. But why I'm, I'm not going to go on about this any more than now, really, except I've got one or two slides, and there are things in it of interest on uh, controls and um, procedures within a company, which I think would be of interest to all of us. That, the, that, that there is a recognition that the small company, but the medium-sized company, owner-owned owner, owner owned company, um, maybe 
doesn't need such rigorous controls, or there'd be a different way of doing things more informal. This ties in with my comment about setting out just what your procedures are. So that's a list of topics, but now let's get through them, not dwell too much. Um, what is the state of auditing? Um, there was a comment from Mr. Moriarty, sounds very Sherlock Holmes, uh, says financial accounting council's pri priority is high quality audits and competition is not an end in itself. That is a big issue that stays globally. It's not just in Britain. It's the, the, the FRC doing all they can to widen the availability, if you like, the mid-tier firms, as some would call them, uh, taking on more large company audits. It's, uh, that's not for discussion here, I mean, at all. It's interesting, the letter from uh, the, the Minister for in Business and Industry, uh, Banrock, or, or she, um, or not, uh, she, she, um, wrote to Mar Moriarty, these are letters are all published, it's interesting, saying, yes, competition, fine, but we want you to do what you can to help positive move a British business. It was good to see that, but I mean, it's not changing things fundamentally. Odd inspections by the FRC, the test is whether there is significant risk that the financial statements could contain an undetected material misstatement as a result found in audit work. So that's the audit inspection. And then things that are done well or maybe missed. And I, I want to remind you, but in some ways, I think the FLC needs reminded, what is the purpose of an audit? The ISAs say it is to consider the risk that the financial statements are, are not defective, I, I make it using that word, in that they would miss a material error due to either fraud or simply error that they're not materially misstated due to these. And the a term in the Companies Act still remains the accounts give a true and fair view. And, and, and you just get the feeling from the ISAs, the auditing standards, that um, we're, um, the, the auditors down the path of policing the, the companies. I, and I've had clients over the last year or two saying, oh, you're policing us now. So, and there's a topic just coming up that uh, uh, I, and issues around it I'll mention. Um, deficiencies, is deficiencies in audit planning. Um, you could look at that slide. We'll, we'll skip that one. Um, that's for auditors. Um, and it goes on. Uh, a huge list of things in planning that you're meant to do. Inquiries of management regarding the process for identifying responding to risk due to fraud. So there's an example where I'm sure at your audit planning stage, your auditor gives you a paper, maybe, or your audit partner or manager you're speaking to sits down and discusses these issues. Discuss broad risk factors with the audit team, obviously, internally. So a lot done in planning, and that's a justification for the price going up. Um, audits have improved. They've become more, you know, it, Rules-based, I'm not meant to say that, they are requirements, but they are more rules-based and there are more forms to fill in with good intention. Um, common deficiencies in audit evidence, uh, I'm going to skip, skip these. Uh, this is pure audit stuff that we don't check existence condition, not verified ownership of the, pro um, the property, motor vehicles, valuation of property, Reliance placed on director's assessment. Now, there's an interesting one. Oh, yeah, the property's worth this, that, or the other. The machine's in good condition. Well, if I'm not an expert in machines, I wouldn't know if it's in good condition or not. Uh, no consideration of deferred tax provision and revaluation re of uh, property. That's a linked item. So, yeah, there, there are deficiencies in audit evidence, but a lot of them come back to not deficiencies in the accounts or you as directors, but no one sort of asked the question. So yes, auditing should be challenging, skeptical. Investments, no adequate assessment made of impairment indications on investments. So again, uh, maybe obvious stuff, we, work has to be done. Ownership of the investments not verified. Um, stock inventory, stock frauds, stock errors will always happen, classic, um, area for a quick win to get the accounts to look right. Double count stock, um, present stock as fine when it's um, impaired. I remember years ago, a company that's did offshore oil work with spray paint stuff and everything else, 
they were being taken over and I was asked to go up. It wasn't a accounts audit, it was a year end, not year end audit, it wasn't an accounts audit, it was an audit because of acquisition and um, turned up at this huge warehouse, airport hangar really, and they had guns laid out, spray guns, they had hoses laid out and everything else, and it all looked beautiful. And yes, there is, you know, at that time, 500,000 and 580,000 of um, stock plant equipment. So it was stock of fixed assets. It was it was stock in the accounts of stock, 580,000. And But looking at it, and not being an expert, but looking at it, oh, these hoses look very firm or hard. So I lifted one up, brittle, it cracked. So I lifted it, cracked. The chap in the company watching me said, stop that. And I went to another one, cracked another one. I, I wasn't being malicious or something. But I mean, yeah, it, 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 there was obvious reason why they were doing that. So stock forever is going to be potentially an area for error or fraud and and maybe more of fraud than error but um so stock stock takes etc very important trade receivables debtors uh, typical work you need to do cash at bank confirm with the banks classification of borrowings between current and non-current not documented uh disclosure of securities these are things the auditor should do but again you accounts preparers um would do you, 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 and if you're not involved in account preparation, you get your auditor to do it and other firm of accountants, you still need to ask the questions. Um, trade and trade payables, um, obvious stuff, I think. Revenue, completeness of income not properly tested. Um, revenue is, uh, is a, a hot topic with auditors that we cannot dismiss revenue as not being material or not being a significant risk to use the audit terms. Now, that is logical and true from the one biggest figure in the accounts ought to be revenue in a sense, not in a sense it should be, because and certainly in the PL account. If revenue in the PL account is the la not largest number, then you've got problems. <laughs> you're, you're not going to have a profit. There's always going to be more costs and, and therefore a loss. So revenue is important. Um, revenue is an area also highly subject to fraud that um, inflated sale bigger, and we've had that, the sale I mentioned earlier, of a company to a company in America, the software um, the in, inflated value of sales that didn't exist. This is where the revenue standard coming in with probable income would be a worry to me. I, as an auditor and a director, I'd worry that our revenue shown in the income statement P&L account um, is backed up by assets, cash received, or valuable work done, um, potentially highly, highly probable income, if you like. So revenue is an important area, obviously. Contingency is often missed, not reported, pure disclosure. Related parties. Now, um, this, interestingly, because speaking is a good thing to do in the sense that you actually have to learn some stuff. Some Maybe four or five years back, I till then, I'd never really studied the Companies Act section related parties. I knew very much as an auditor and people preparing accounts that one had to disclose related parties. Companies Act is full of quite a lot of detail that's required, but we never seem to refer to that as such. What we have to refer to is the accounting stand, F, standard FRS 102, but particularly auditing comes in here. And this is where um, you are as you grow and as your company might merges, get sold, whatever. And related parties are a very interesting area. You've got what were the weaknesses that point out what we should do. In, Relevant procedures to identify related parties not undertaken, including making inquiries of management about changes in related parties. Now, who are related parties? Companies Act says, and the standard says, it's directors, key personnel, and their family members, related family. It really is potentially very wide. Um, an example, just from recently, a file review, um, related parties, I hadn't mentioned other family members, and my reply was, these two sons of the business um, were farmers with their own farms and not involved in any way with the company. Did we need to state that in the accounts? I mean, it's this is where auditing and whatever starts getting a bit over the top, I would think, 
others would disagree. But I mean, how far do you go disclosing related parties when it's the family member side and everything else? It is, if you look at the auditing standard, it's not as draconian as some would interpret it. So you've got, got to be very, read carefully what it says. But what you are looking for is that um, there's a, I mean, simple thing, small business. The brother runs a company which supplies your company and you're concerned the prices are overinflated because the company makes a lot, but the brother's company makes a profit because, blah, blah, blah. you know, there's endless scenarios where tax avoidance is happening, never mind evasion. Uh, that's just, just one of many examples, groups, etc. So related parties are exceedingly important. Um, and there's clear disclosure required by company law, by the accounting standards, and the auditors have to check this. So related parties are a very important area. Um, group account issues, and, and I'll, I'll touch on the related parties again, group accounting issues, um, the issues there, and I'll maybe deal with this now and I won't need to come back to it again later, um, the changes are just a tightening up that you could say that uh, the auditor group com, group accounts it, it is weak, is potentially weak. Because, I mean, I, I've won where there are overseas subsidiaries, um, companies UK based, Spanish operated, overseas other um, activities. The None of the subsidiaries are by themselves material. So there's minimal work done, and I think that will remain the case. There's no risk, in fact. You go, you go through, an auditor goes through a lot of work to, to arrive at the judgment. You're like, this is, my judgment's important. But undoubtedly, um, groups with overseas activities, different jurisdictions, different culture, they might have accounting standards, um, maybe better work needs to be done. Uh, more needs to be considered of materiality. There is a new ISA just coming into effect. And from my perspective, it requires more work that should have been done anyway, I suppose. So you're not seeing changes in accounting here. Um, I think we will see maybe more thorough disclosure and uh, tightening up in the work. And back to related parties, um, related party disclosure. So definite live issues for growing companies, for existing companies. Professional scepticism, an attitude that includes a questioning mind, being alert to conditions, um, and the auditor is meant to have professional scepticism at all times. Uh, yeah, so we are sceptical. I, 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 you, you, you get a bit fed up hearing it as an auditor, but yeah, and I hope we are sceptical. Um, the honourable client, this is my heading from a talk, um, the auditor, can, and, and in fact, my point here is that this A24 is from the standard on, on uh, uh, clients, related parties, etc. cetera. Um, A24, A means it's a guidance note, so it's not, it's not the standard. But the auditor cannot be expected to disregard past experience of the honesty and integrity of an, en an entity's management and those charged with governance. And I actually use that term in my audit file, this is an honourable client, and I you know, give examples, but the standard guidance goes on to say, nevertheless, a belief that management, those charged with governance are honest and have integrity does not relieve the auditor need to maintain professional scepticism or allow the auditor to be satisfied with less and persuasive audit evidence when obtaining reasonable assurance. So I'm afraid we're still going to be sceptical and whatever. Um, and I've got an add on there about estimates, but I'll come to estimates. But yes, clients are honourable, and we should state that, but we do need to be sceptical. So forgive us if we ask. At, at times, I feel impertinent questions, but they maybe need asked. Right. This is the one that's topical and uh, interesting. There is a requirement, and there's a whole standard on um, auditors looking at laws and regulations. Um, we're required to look and remain alert to the possibility that the requirement eight means that the requirement, it's a rule. The auditor is required, must be alert and look for the possibility that other audit procedures applied for the purpose of forming opinion may bring instances of non-compliance. Maintaining professional skepticism is important. And then 24 says that if in the auditor's judgment, the non-compliance referred to is believed to be intentional and material, the auditor shall communicate the matter to those charged with governance. Now, that seems fine. 
uh, I, I think it makes perfect sense that we are awake at all times. And if we find there's non-compliance, we, if the client doesn't know of it, we talk to them. The problem with laws and regulations is that it's absolutely a necessary and correct standard that um, if, if the company um, runs a restaurant chain, what laws do we have? There are lots of them. We have health and safety in the kitchen and we have food hygiene in the kitchen and serving customers, etc. So what am I meant to do? Uh, do an inspection of my health and safety officer, inspector? No. I, at a minimum, will ask, have there been cases this year? To the directors, the directors, but also to, depends on the size of the company, to the managers, the appropriate manager, per person, head chef, what events have been. If there has been a, a health and safety small incident, a burn or something, what's the legal position, lawyers, et cetera, you look, and yes, the employee is doing and has left the company, then, uh, you know, what is the amount? Because this is where laws and regulations become important. There, there could be a potential 500,000 claim against the company for some health and safety or other infringement. Of course, you've got to ask the question, of course, you've got to dig into it, and it could well mean a disclosure in the accounts or, or certainly a provision in the accounts. So laws and regulations are important. But how much more do we have to do? Um, the FRC wanted and wants a revision to this standard that is pending in exposure draft, us to do more. Um, I certainly replied to this because I, you know, I felt strongly that this is this client's are you policing us? That, you know, there must be a line somewhere. And the, the Institute, the English Institute, did an excellent reply saying, look, there is a limit to what we auditors can do. And I, 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 you do get the feeling, to me, this is a drift of governments and it's uh, working in other countries and other, the real industry are involved in. You do get the feeling that governments generally are lazy and sort of path stuff down. This is where it can proliferate. If you've not got clear laws, then, you know, passing it down is not going to help. But laws and regulations are important and directs need to be aware of them and full disclosures need to be made. That's an absolutely correct party line. Um, deficiencies in internal control, obviously the auditor shall communicate to management at appropriate level, level the responsibility to have proper controls on a timely basis. Other deficiencies in internal control that have not been communicated by other parties and in the auditor's professional judgment are of sufficient importance to merit attention should be reported. So that I think we know is important, um, but it's bringing me on to this fact that a good financial reporting starts with the board, clear rules, um, I've used the word rules, but they are rules, clear description of controls and the operation of them. So that takes me to this ISA that I mentioned, if you don't know it, identifying and assessing risk um, requires the auditor to exercise professional judgment in planning and performing an audit with professional skepticism. Fine, that's what we should do. Um, the, the key point of a client's review of judgments will often be personal. Um, and the drivers and the motives for conclusions on subjectivity are many. Um, what I'm getting at here is, you know, being skeptical about a client. I, I tell you, what, what are the drivers? Are they higher revenue, lower costs, higher profits, higher asset values? A main driver in a sense, I should have that as the heading, demonstrating, demonstrating success. I mean, what I'm getting at, I think, is, is the company ge genuinely successful or are these wishful things? And what is an auditor I'm looking for? And you as a board will be aware are there risks in not achieving these? Are there risks that some of your management folk are feel under pressure, are under pressure to uh, make mistakes, fraud, or errors could happen? Um, the personal angle to clients' views demonstrates what, demonstrates what auditors know, that we need to be sceptical about client judgment. So I'm afraid we do need to be sceptical, absolutely. Right. And this is something I'm sure you, those subject to audit, I, I, maybe if you legally, legal people are not directly involved at the time, um, your auditors should ask you what 
uh, do you consider your risk factors? Because we have to ask the question, um, the nature of the client and management, the type of business, the customer suppliers, the nature of estimates of any, the nature of assets, liabilities, the complex accounting, the management, possibility of management, bias or fraud. Second, bottom one, other driver pressures on management. So the whole idea of reviewing inherent risk factors and we auditors discussing it with the board, the, the, the MD, the operating officer, whoever is appropriate, um, are very, very important if we're to get reliable financial reporting. This is coming back to reliable financial report, um, reliable accounts that people can trust. So considering risk, I'm sure you're hearing about it. If you haven't, you will, that's for sure. Um, and there's my slide summing that up. Um, what does the client perceive as risk areas where judgments are required? And you then take this down to the level of assertion. I, I, is, because this was American-based, the, the use of words that may be alien to me, or to us, to English, but it, 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 apparently the standards, in, uh, the auditing standards, not only apparently, they absolutely make it clear that management owners and directors make assertions about figures. They, they, they don't know it, but they do. That's the point. <laughs> they, they, I don't think they ever accept anything, but they, you know, if, if a, a company gives me their draft account prepared by their finance team and the director that approved them, um, to me, um, I could ask them, are you asserting these are correct? And they would. That's the English use of the word. So it is worth asking, uh, as we do, as auditors, but as the um, directors have to ask themselves, are are there issues with cash that um, are dubious? Yes, it's with a dodgy bank, the money, you know, it's all in bonds or whatever else. Are there assertions about stock? Absolutely, there might be that we're not sure of the age of stock or we're not sure how it's deteriorating. Then I, I would hope they would be honest about that because what we're looking for are reliable figures. Um, descriptive notes, detailed, tailored accounting policies are helpful. The FRC has rightly called for more specifically tailored policies. However, might these be cover for poor, if not dubious, accounting? I mean, the, the danger here is I, I, as a skeptical auditor, would be pleased to see simply that um, stock is held at cost or net realizable value, is the old term, um, and, and stop there. Um, I would quite like to see different lines of stock and what we do to test for impairment of stock. That would be interesting. But if it then goes off into a whole war and peace on the subject, then you start thinking, what are they covering? So it's really interesting of risk. You know, it's straight question, straight answer. Yeah, it's better accounting policy so that people reading the accounts know that with inventory or stock, um, a difficult area is the um, in, the impairment stock with age, but this has been dealt with and there are procedures. So um, more thorough accounting policy and, and, and practices, if you like. Um, risks that require um, particular attention. Attention. We have a term that's come in, which is, I think, a very good one, that um, we talk of significant risk because accounting well, until recently, I, I can't point, pinpoint the date when significant risk came in, probably long, longer ago than, than I remember, but accounts forever, and you will still have the terms at a meeting talking about material issues. So a material figure is inventory. Um, why? Because it's a big number. But a, an interesting point is, is it's significant? And the answer is no. It is very clearly stock in boxes, which can be accounted, are not deteriorating. Um, if there is a risk, it's a, a miscounting, there's no other risk. Whereas there could be a, an amount of stock which is 9% of the worth of the company, which, you know, rough terms traditionally would be lower 10% threshold. So what? There's no stock. It's not going to destroy the company. It's not going to affect the profit and make it a loss. Um, what's the problem? Well, the point is, it, it which is a significant risk because it maybe could deteriorate, it could disappear. In which case, you need to deal with that or disclose the fact. So um, the auditing considers significant risk. It's maybe a term you should be using as managers, owners, directors. I, I would certainly use what are the significant risks in this entity? Are they disclosed in the accounts? You, you, you should be seeing the term in 
judgment under heading judgments account before accounting policies. Policies are cover these areas and particularly this area of significant risk. And for us, but the risk of uh, fraud, whether the risk is related to recent significant economic accounting or other developments, a risk due to complexity of transactions, whether the risk involves significant transactions from related parties, that's significant because it could lead to fraud and other things. The degree of subjectivity in the measurement of financial information, whether the risk involves significant transactions outside normal business. So the idea of thinking of things as material is fine and is forever with it, but also when we come to risk, significant risk is very important. Um, again, professional judgment endlessly, I have to say endlessly, crops up. In general, misstatements are considered to be material if they could reasonably be expected to influence economic decisions that users taken on the basis of financial information and financial statements as a whole. That's not the numerical level, that's from originally um, IASB. Um, and, and don't go away with thinking if something's 9% um, out, it doesn't matter. I just think, you know, an overall view would be with a healthy company, plenty of assets and good profit, that if something was out for 10%, it's not going to change the picture. And materiality becomes a lot more critical at the level of a barely profitable company, obviously. I mean, materiality really, you know, your focus then changes dramatically. Um, response to assessed risk, um, the performing asset control, the audit, more persuasive audit evidence, the greater alliance and audit places on the control. That's itself. Yeah, there are the answers actually, unfortunately, are very verbose, and that's the typical example of being the obvious. Um, right. I, and I'm going to come to talk about this. I think we'll um, have a look now. It's 11 11, and time I shut up, but we'll look at this and I will quickly go through the rest of the day to make sure I'm not going on unnecessarily. So let's have this um, quiz. Do you think, and I'll say a little more, do you think your accounting procedures and controls are well documented, in, informally documented, or not documented? Or are they? Is the question. Well documented, 24, um, 36%, informally 53, and not documented 11. Well, not documented, quite normal, don't worry. Um, informally documented, um, very typical for small and medium-sized companies, well documented, well done. Um, and what do I have to say? I have, after this, this weekend, actually, to write up the control as I perceive them at a client for that and, and to go through with them and they, they they said this would be very helpful I've done this and I have to do this because I have to do it as an auditor but um, they have to have something on paper uh, interestingly I, I saw one um, I think it was mentioned at the beginning you've got the topic um, you know moving on as a company new owners or whatever else um, in, in this particular case I'm working on the, the company's growing and staff are changing. You absolutely need to have documented systems. You know that. Um, I'm boring on. It's 13 minutes past. So let's start at 20 past. Um, 10, 13 and 10 is 23, 25 past, 25 past. Thank you. Right, uh, welcome back, and we've jumped to slide 104. <clears throat> well, I have, if you care to, but it should be on the screen. Far too much stuff on auditing, which I which I knew, um, and I, you know, I could have bore on and hope have auditing auditors' issues tied to reporting that are useful. And I hope I've done that. I, I, the, the topics covered are in the slides we've missed, you might want to look at, are on controls, estimates, and um, there's more on being skeptical. I think we get too much of it. I'm sure we do. Um, on controls, I've said, I think, a bit already. One thing I've noticed personally is that 
I think the ISAs almost don't take recognition that most businesses today will have accounting systems that are reliable and are the one thing you want to test uh, is the general ledger. You can download the general ledger in a form that suits XLS and you can run seek and all sorts of things on it. The, um, it, it in some ways the ISIS to me seem a little bit in the steam age in some days, if I use a real metaphor, um, in what they expect. But um, certainly controls are important and that's yet another reason tying in where we left that you outlining the controls you have and um, how they operate, that's useful to an auditor. And an auditor can check that, you know, what I'm looking for is a, I believe, and tested reliable general ledger, nominal ledger to some people, general ledger, which underlies reliable figures. And then we have the issue of accounting policies and how we treat them, of course. Uh, but controls are very important. And a, a little bit more on that just in a minute. Estimates, um, there was a new ISA auditing standard a year or two back. Um, everything's an estimate. I mean, again, things get overplayed, but you, you almost get this feeling depreciation's an estimate. Well, of course it is. Um, the number of years life and is there a residual value and these could change so it's an estimate but um, I think you can overplay it but estimates are important so you might as whether auditors I mean you should know this stuff of course but um, others might like to look at the intervening slides a slide after this 125 to 132 on scalability I'm coming to there are slides of script through which you might just have a read and say, oh, very interesting, very obvious. I mean, as I say, the, the ISIS are verbose and often they state the blindingly obvious. Um, but what we, I, I want to look at the ta tax and um, strategic reports, some points there in the program, not to miss these, um, but just skipping through um, the point, uh, the, the subject of um, auditing judgments, but professional judgment generally, because the FRC paper was addressed not just to auditors, but to you know, those preparing accounts and looking at accounts. And there's, there's loads of supporting material, and you've got the, the links there. And make this alive, thank you. And uh, all of it these days, they, they all must go on MBA courses or something and come up with charts. I, I, you've got to work out, does it work from the centre out or the out or towards the centre? It seems to work from the centre because mindsets first. And a load of these terms are hackneyed. They really are. And you, I, I was looking back at something we're, we're coming to clutter tech from well, 20 years ago nearly. Um, it was the start of using terms like mindset, all good stuff. Um, anyway, um, judgment, there's a framework that you should have the right mindset. Um, there's trigger to make you say, I need to do but judgment here. There's consultation and environmental factors. There's nothing to do with the environment as we get talked about weather and climate change. It's the environment you're working in, the pressures, etc. cetera. So um, some notes there, which I'll get through mindset, um, professional skepticism again, understanding your biases, that's a topical point that apparently we all have um, unrecognized bias, biases. Uh, my biases are totally recognized, but anyway. And funnily enough, one ISA talks about that, that uh, we, we acknowledges we have biases, and again, we have to deal with them. It's not the unknown ones maybe we, we should worry about. It's the ones we know we have and are proud of. Um, so, um, Understanding biases is important. Sensitivity to uncertainty. Not doing enough um, sensitivity analysis is the answer to that, really. And um, the judgment process, consultation, environmental factors. Environmental factors, they're the sort of things you should think about if you're dealing with accounts. You are the accountant. You're, it's your company. What's your culture? You're the audit firm. What's your culture? The relevant information, time and resources, etc. The culture is terribly important. I mean, I've realized that with being fortunate enough to speak elsewhere and travel, work elsewhere. Um, you're, it's not a case of dismissing a culture, it's understanding it and working with it. Um, there was a thematic review on judgments and estimates, many good examples, um, granular disclosure explaining things, but there were weaknesses um, as well. Uh, focusing on estimates, they looked at judgments there and they weren't as good as they might be. Significant estimates were supported, the good ones, information about assumptions made, 
specific amount of risk, some degree of sensitivity of disclosure. I mean, this is relevant to financial reporting in that if you have a your company, a company you're looking at that has a figure that they clearly indicate is uh, relies on estimates, and I mean, they disclose this, then you would expect to see supporting material showing how they judged to, to, to get to the estimate that's in the accounts. And room for improvement companies should explicitly state whether estimates have a significant risk of material adjustment. Very, very, very important. I mean, you're kind of, kind of is a term I hate, but if you, you are there, um, if you're saying, yes, they could reverse, and you're hoping to sell your company, that, uh, you're not one to do that. It's some difficult issues here, very much so. Um, sensitive disclosure should be provided more frequently in a way that's most meaningful to readers. I mean, you've got to understand who your readers are. Companies should reassess whether the disclosures made in a previous year need to be revised. So um, sensible enough stuff. For significant judgments, we expect companies to separately identify the judgments that do not relate to a source of estimation uncertainty and those that do give detailed descriptions of specific material judgments made by the directors. So this is pure financial reporting and dragging in the directors, dragging in the there. Um, we, we expect um, judgments to be made where there are significant figures. So that's this word, significant judgment, significant risk, if you like. It's a good word to use. Um, what a significant risk. Again, this is from the, one of the papers on, on, on judgments. And they love to use these typical charts that if you're down at zero on the scale here, that management and potential mistake, there's no problem, likelihood of occurring, no problem, so don't worry. It's when you get up into the, the top and uh, right-hand side that you, you, you're maybe running into problems, that you have a high risk and it's highly likely to happen. It's a big amount highly likely to happen. Um, and here's reference that first IFAC paper on first time implementation of um, related particular ISO 315, really excellent paper. Um, overarching principles, uh, professional judgments there for all of us, and it applies to smaller entities. The work to be formed, er, it, iterative nature of the standard, fine. Ah, this one I have to show you. This chart is meant to help us deal with risk assessment and understanding where judgments are made etc or may be needed all i'll say about it is it's the work of a troubled mind <laughs> you know, I, germany's just adopted um ifrs and and, and yes yeah, sorry it's not just adopted IFRS, it's just adopted auditing standards and speaking to a to a friend to a with a friend in in a uh, medium-sized practice in provincial Germany, they were coming to this, and I said, oh, I must send you a chart, and um, this will help you no end. <laughs> so there it is. And um, serious business, so um, judgments and estimates and, and risk, and, and it's not just an audit issue, it's important for good financial reporting, it's important for good business. Uh, final point here on a uh, uh, high-risk area, journals are high-risk. And what do I mean by that? Day-to-day, month-end journals accruing for something, holiday pay, doing whatever, fine. You can soon look and see if they're reasonable, consistent, the amounts are not odd. But you certainly need to look at the year-end ones where accounts are prepared because um, that's where you can get the big error and the big fraud. And there's no two ways about it. So the review of journals, and it, it is something our, the FRC go on about quite rightly. Control deficiencies. Um, quite a lot on that documentation formerly is a professional judgment scalability right this is this is maybe for auditors to read but this should be slide one two five indeed it is i just put these in the other day and because i'm looking at this i'm maybe going to talk on it to a body um we we've not got the standard for smaller entities um it it, it it's not only claimed, it is correct that this ISA on risk, et cetera, has sections on scal scal scalability, meaning you, you, how you do things might be simpler, put it that way, that's what it means. And it's very, very interesting. It talks of help, but I have to say it doesn't help very much. To be honest, my view is that I, I don't see how you can scale a rule. 
And the ISAs, the auditing standards, are all based on rules. Uh, they, they're called requirements, but they are rule-based requirements. And how do you scale down a requirement? Um, what is important, in, and it's a, I'll say this for ISA 315, it actually does discuss the issues and it makes a very point, for, for example, for small entities, owner, owner managed business, that a lot is informal, there will not be a map or a paper on internal controls, that controls are informal but happen, and the auditor can deal with this by observation, which I have done. I don't know if it satisfies file reviewers. But so all of you might like to look at these slides, one, two, five, to 132. Um, it's an interesting area, which um, as long as I keep going, I'll look at a little bit more. Um, from out of my own interest, etc. So do have a look at those. But moving on through them, HMRC issues, what issues are burning issues? Um, and a quiz for you. I, 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 very quick, quick quiz. Just to, it's, I hope, it, hope these are fun, if nothing else. Political, maybe. There should be a does, of course, for the last one. It says poorly drafted quiz, but I think you know what I mean. Straightforward. Um, that's that's good. A lot a lot is. Um, I, on HMRC, get some things right. You know, um, time consuming, yes, 51% and does require help. That, yeah, that's, we don't need to be political there. I mean, that uh, should be, the talk to tax simplification, it just gets worse. Yeah, so we all know that. No, Maybe no surprises there. So let's move on. Um. I, I, I mean, I'm not a tax expert. I never was, uh, but I have to deal with tax and I have to be aware of it. But, you know, so what I've done here is try and get things that might be topical. One thing is the one issue might be if you're a smaller company going to medium or if you are a smaller company or whatever, um, depends on your profits. Um, we have marginal relief and issues have arisen there because we've got the, we're back to marginal relief Relief is a thing from the past in a way, but it's back with us. We have the tax rates of 19%, 25%. And as you move size of company, or and in this case, size of, size of profit. So there have been issues there. Um, who can claim marginal relief? Your company can um, with the profits of between 50 and 250. If your accounting period is short in 12 months, you prorate, et cetera. The, the, the one that people have been caught out on and Cost money in tax to pay, if, if not penalties, is the fact if you're associated companies that the limits will be again prorated. So, and that happened to me years and years ago. And you know, takes you back to the old um, years of different rates of corporation tax. Um, so, look out for that. Um, and there's lots of information on this company with associated companies. I have given you all the references. And this is where one thing I'll say the at times HMRC are and try to be helpful. Lots of information papers there. There's funny, I'm trying to think that one of these was interesting. Um associated company definition, attribution to person of rights and powers of their partners, association through a trustee. Uh, I, I just thought this might be of interest in, in for people generally. The legal eagles, the lawyer, lawyers, the accountants, and I hadn't realized how complicated it might be. Um, hopefully, the good news is you're so big, you don't have small rate corporation tax. <laughs> you're so wealthy, you're happy to pay the higher rate, and you don't have a problem. But oh, worth, worth looking at. And so it went on, actually. Yeah. Um, simplifying the reporting for income tax and national insurance on benefits in kind, that's something coming. It's going to be a live thing. It's going to be simpler, um, but your payroll people will know of that. Um, not, it doesn't change what um, 
benefits and kind are. It's not changing that. It's just the way the, the management of them, the reporting and, and the and the collection of tax, of course. Um, I put this in because I get involved in quite a lot of it, but I won't dwell on it. Um, I, I, we're coming to R and D, which maybe more of you are. Um, I hadn't realised there were so many, and in some ways I hadn't realised what headings I was under doing the work. But the work I was doing was more on audit of grants for creative industries, etc., rather than the, the tax side. Others were doing the tax returns. But um, it, it may help you, maybe in these industries, you may be able to help your company claim reliefs, get relief, whatever. Um, and the you may be able to claim the following reliefs for, on your company tax return. Film tax relief, animation relief, films, video. What really amused me, I'm dying for someone to tell me, what is high end television? We certainly don't have any in Britain. So that's why if you, someone who doesn't even have a television, actually. But um, no, uh, audiovisual games, um, video games, that's, you know, tech people and everything else. I, I presume they and their accountants know there's relief available. But um, I know certainly for the performing arts and theatre, et cetera, filmmaking, um, you know, useful stuff. Um, conditions, your company must have responsibility throughout development, production, et cetera. Cultural test. And that's, what, again, where I've been involved, the BFI, that you have to prove it. It's a mostly a British or entirely a British input. But that that may be passing interest of only. Um, the preventing abuse of R&D um, changes, again, if you've got clients involved in this area, I'm sure you're already aware of this. I, I spoke to one who regularly does it and doesn't seem bothered, worried. Um, it's just that they're it, it's simplifying it, um, really, that the small and big will merge in, in the sense of the way you do things. Um, policy objective, this is maybe important. The R&D tax relief um, incentivized firms uh, are a core part of government support, blah, blah, blah. The... the um, in the SME payable R&D tax credit provides value to report, et cetera. However, the tax credit has become a target for fraud and abuse and measures respond to that, uh, go, go, uh, ensuring that relief goes to the immediate is, is the, the, the point, the policy. Absolutely right, because as I think I said right at the start, uh, you, know, you get people come up to you and say, oh, you're an account, you know about R&D relief, can I get it, and this, that, and the other. Um, I, I was... I was a little bit surprised about the laxity, um, not of any people I've been dealing with, but you know, they do full reports, et cetera, but yes, it has been a subject of fraud. Um, but I'm sure you're aware of that. And But, but on the other hand, if you're not, R&D relief is a great thing. A company is exempt of a cap if its employees are creating, um, preparing to create or managing intellectual property, does not spend more than 50% of R&D on subcontracting R&D to others. So um, that's a current tax issue. Um, changes in reporting, self-employment and partners. This, I don't think, is of interest. This is for un, um, unincorporated businesses. Um, the tax base is changing. I'm sure those that need to know are all well aware of this. But you've got the slides if you're affected, how to report the profit, profit, et cetera. <clears throat> and um, IR35 off payroll changes will uh, take effect. I mean, that's an ongoing, um, that's an ongoing business. The IR thirty five never satisfactory come to a, well, it has, hasn't really come to a satisfactory situation. I'd say I was going to say settlement, but situation. But there are changes there. Um, rush through that um, because I don't think I think you'll know about them. And if there are other tax issues, you can ask. There's one question I haven't looked at. I, I would have to pass you on ex elsewhere because I'm no tax expert. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I'm aware of what goes on. The information your clients put on their website. Now, I, I thought, well, I'll get something this. Well, um, I hadn't realized this. I, I was going to speak to my website guru and ask if I have all this in my website. Now, do you do wonder? I, I just thought this was interesting. Under the electronic commerce, uh, EC Direct, and blah, 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 the following, uh, this information related to the business on the website. The following must be included in the website. And I just hope all mine is, but I will be checking that forthwith. Um, so this title maybe was promoted by someone asking about what should you put on in the way of marketing, etc. Well, again, I'm no marketeer. I, I would say honest stuff. Of course, it would be um, accounting information. Yes, 
and, and this comes back to good financial reports, you know, an extract from the your business model and strategy it taken from your strategic report could go on your website, be, you know, double up and one's good for one thing and it's good for the other. But um, I've got that list there and you might want to check it. Um, right, strategic reports was a particular topic people wanted to cover and just a few things on that. Um, what is a strategic report? The purpose is to provide information for shareholders and help them assess how directors have performed their duty under section 172. Now that's the uh, larger companies, is, 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 there's limits when you have to follow the 172 or not. Um, but it, it's, it's clearly set out in the in company law that what, what you have to do. What is in a strategic report? Um, the original paper on this, the FRC again, you want to talk about your strategic management, the strategy and business model, business environment, trends, business performances, your accounts, what's happened and analysis. So it's, it's analyzing what's in the accounts. The one thing I, I think is weaken quite a lot of them, I look at, and certainly clients I've talked to, is they actually describing the business model. Maybe it's because they assume, and then maybe it is the case, that it's blatantly obvious that a business running a restaurant or several restaurants is running a restaurant, taking money for food, liquor, and uh, making a profit. You know, maybe the, the point is that there's not a lot to say about the business model. Strategy is yeah, honest, good, decent business, is safe. Food sold, it's, you know, you're in incentive, you're into marketing, but presumably strategies grow the business. So the the elements of the strategic report are well known, well set out. Um, weaknesses reported the FRC over the years are not covering enough in one area, they're not being balanced as well. The, the classic one and something I'm going to come on to is that they don't link well enough with the accounts they're sort of there and well, where does that figure come from or profits down and yet it's been a glorious year um yeah I, you wouldn't make those mistakes but they do happen um communication principles reports should be fair balanced understandable concise forward-looking include entity include entity specific information and link related information in different parts of the annual report so that's the important thing about linking across the report. Um, the 172 section where relevant, um, the, the likely consequences of any decisions in the long term, the interests of the company's employees, the need to foster the company's business relationships, the impact on the company's operation, the desirability of company retaining a reputation, of course, the need to act fairly. I mean, how you answer these without just going into fluff in a way, but um, those, those are areas, and again, apparently from the FRC report, maybe weakly covered or ignored. So and, and in this very brief session, I'm really only reminding you what needs to be done. Um, come to this, as I, I thought, a finale. What, what I would say, I mean, um, Tom Lehrer, people won't know him now, is an American. He's still alive, actually, mathematician. Wonderful songs like Poisoning Pigeons in the Park or the Masochism Tango. Wonderful. You should listen to them. You get them on YouTube. Wonderful, hilarious songs. He had a saying in one of his, his songs about a Russian chap um, who got his academic paper in by plagiarizing. The line is, plagiarize, plagiarize. That's why God majorize. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's, it's we do it. Good sense. Get company accounts and look at prize-winning company accounts strategic report. See what people are doing. You know, new ideas, but do also come up with your own. How one thing you can do with your own is cut clutter. Where is it to be found? It answers everywhere. Um, FRC suggestions focus on those elements that are relevant to the company and have significant impact on its long term success. It doesn't mean miss the others, it doesn't boast the future it means focus on them provide a cross reference we come to that again use plain and clear english um and i haven't fortunately got the quote here i found this the, these slides actually came from some years back when cutting clutter was all the thing the 
ASB then, as it was, not the FRC, published a paper on cutting clutter, very laudable. Um, it, the, the paper on cutting clutter was pages on how to cut clutter, and it ran to um, 49 pages, which I don't think they saw the irony of it. Anyway, it, it's still a good paper. And quickly through one or two of these slides, and it will be time to wind up. Um, the FRC paper focuses on two problems, areas where it believes lead to clutter, immaterial disclosures that inhibit the ability to identify and understand relevant information. Now, I, and I would blame some financial reporting, and I, you know, I, that in fact, the stuff is immaterial. I mean, classic comment we auditors will get about accounts is, oh, um, the, you've missed an accounting policy on something. In fact, you're a, the company law says you, it's material relevant accounting policies, and the auditing standard allows that too, that there is a tendency to have redundant accounting policies. It's a classic thing that they're redundant in the sense that the company never does what the accounting policy relates to. So um, it's certainly a good clear out of what's there and make them sharp and clear. Explanatory information that remains unchanged will actually moving past stuff. So you 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 could improve financial reporting by cutting clutter. Um, how can we clutter, review and remove redundant stuff, understand and use the concept of materiality judiciously? So materiality, uh, and I would bring in significant, significant significance, if you like, uh, remove inhibiting behavioral practices. I, I, I just think a slide on that. Redundant words and figures are of the, of, of the, uh, are obvious, and it, only time is taken to review critically, if, if only time is taken. Um, one way of tackling this would be to ask a member of staff who is knowledgeable regarding disclosures but has not seen previous year's documents to list what, as a minimum, they would expect to find. Actually, this is very good as a training thing for whether you're auditor, accountant, or whatever. Um, and it trains the staff in a sense practically and also gives you consultancy, so um, free consultancy. So um, that, that's a good idea. Um, the conceptual framework um, talks about material. Yeah, we've had that definition earlier. Disclosure of accounting policies. An entity shall disclose in summary of significant accounting policies, accounting policies used that are relevant what is significant, relevant, has to be subjective, yes. But but they do recognise that it's not every accounting policy for a figure that's barely there. I mean, one would be higher purchase. You can think of a client who this year has no higher purchase, but they're paying off the last last year. You wouldn't even, you don't need the accounting policy for higher purchase. People will start looking for it, and it was 500 quid or something, the tail of that loan last year. So um, cutting clutter may be, may be obvious. Um, what affects behavior? This is hilarious because this is now 2014. It's over 10 years old. No, 2010. It's over well over 10 years old. Um, what affects behavior genetics? But how much do they affect and govern individuals' tendencies? This is not me. It, it, that is a fascinating one. It must have been in, in vogue in social science departments then or something. Attitude, social norms, we still got them. Faith, hmm. Downplayed. I, I I thought those were just interesting in, in that there may be a little historical. Um, influences on human behavior. Again, interesting. Uh, it's this is un, unconscious biases. It's this sort of thing. Um, it's fascinating how things change. Salience. I don't suppose a lot of people know what it meant now, but uh, there we are. Priming sounds rather dubious, um, etc. Anyway, yeah, I, I've left these in for amusement. Project management decluttering, um, it's not a cheap as simply taking a red pen. It's really this idea of getting some to review the accounts and tackling the things that earlier, the redundant things, etc. And, and you've got to ask what's the commitment. Um, take time to identify problems. Good question to ask is who uses your financial statements? And that's where I think a private family owned company, um, own, owner managed, they don't see anyone else is using them. I mean, they know that the credit agencies will, but they're, if they're sound companies, their credit rating doesn't matter to them. They've got a good credit rating, so what? Um, but, you know, with your reports, or uh, you, they're a good question to ask. I mean, are they meeting the requirements and are there plans to communicate more effectively? I mean, the, the annual accounts are a good with the, the annual accounts, particularly with the strategic report, are a good way of communicating. Um, do they improve matters? Will the new disclosures enhance? 
uh, well, new disclosures partially duplicate, in which case cut, cut the cutter. Uh, does the emphasis placed on various elements accurately reflect the significant items? I mean, what they're saying is balanced there. That term we had. Review of accounting policies are, are they up to date? Are they for significant figures? Are they detailed enough? Are they clear enough? And are they redundant ones? And I, I, I didn't mean to rush to that then, but within two minutes, I rushed to the end. So um, apologies if things were out of balance. Um, you know, if I was doing it again, I know I will go and cut stuff out and make other figures bigger, but you've got the slides you might like to look at areas I've skipped over. Um, I always think of these events, if there's one or two points that you can take away and use, then that's that's good. Um, just thank you very much for listening and um, all the best with your dealing with financial reports. Thank you very much.